Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. All right, so I have no idea where I put all this stuff at, and isn't that great? Just spent an hour um, working on, you know, working on today's talk, and I'm excited about it. So I seeing that it, I am being heard, so that works. Um, sometimes my kids get the stuff and pretend like they're on doing a TV show together, so uh, I'll have it ready for. Part of you. I have it ready for next week. Good morning and welcome, uh, or afternoon or evening or wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to Revolution Gathering. I um, hope you're all well. Um, I'd like to thank Zoe for filling in last week. That was awesome. Uh, they did a great job. I, I have not heard the talk, but we've talked about it, and I will be listening. I'm just... Um, I've had my kids since I got back, and so I'm a little bit crazy. <laughs> Haven't had a minute to, to think. Um, went to the fair yesterday, the Washington State Fair, which is like an hour from here, and is probably one of the biggest financial ripoffs. Um, oh my gosh, you had a heart attack? Good Lord. I'm so sorry to hear that. Wow, that's scary. Um, that's a... Goodness, we're all really, everybody's going through it. That's a oh, hard one to pull back from there. Um, so I won't be complaining <laughs> anymore today. Um, so uh, went to the fair with my kids. It was great. It was way too expensive. Um, I don't know how they get away with it um, with all these Washington folks, let them um, doing what they do because it is so expensive and they really just take advantage of you in the most uh, obvious ways. Uh, they give kids free tickets at their school <laughs> and then you take them and spend like a few hundred bucks trying to just win really crappy stuffed animals and ride really questionable rides. Anyhow, so... There you go. There's my two cents on that. Um, I, as some of you may know, I was at uh, Steve's uh, memorial last week, and um, and it was it was good. It was it was wild. I mean, it was uh, it was the longest memorial I think I've ever been to. It was almost four hours. Matter of fact, they they had a afterwards they had like a little gathering, and the catering only had thirty minutes left because it went so long, but. It was really a legacy of, of, of Steve's life and all the people he touched. And, and it was such a group of such diverse types of folks. And um, it, was, it was really beautiful. Um, I got to speak and didn't think I would make it through it, the talk because I thought I would cry too much. I did cry, but I made it through the talk. And I was grateful for it. And I kind of got to celebrate his life along with my mom's life and their connection. Um, yeah, it was heavy. I mean, it was, it was heavy. I got to hang out with some really great folks from uh, the MCC, Metropolitan Community Church, who I hadn't seen in years. And that was really uh, fantastic. And have conversations with people who told me that they've heard the work that's going on here. And that they're trying to treat other people who don't agree with them uh, with more respect and kindness because of our work and because of what's happening at Revolution. And I was really, like, excited to hear that, you know. Um, you know, folks who kind of, you know, who host podcasts were like, you know, you know I mean, that's a big thing in podcasts, you know, you, you make fun of, you know, you give people a hard time. And when, um, when we're affecting to that level, like, people are hearing what we're saying and arguing well, um, 
to me, that's the, that's the key to success. You know, that's the key to, that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to get people to uh, not scapegoat each other and not be distracted by uh, the things that I think the, the, I want to say the majority, but really what I think is the minority of power wants us to think and argue about and keep us distracted with. So I thought that was really great. Um, Steve had done some voiceovers early on, and he had done one for Plato, which was really awesome. And I got to hear that. I got to hear all of his voiceovers and got to see some of his uh, acting. And, and uh, somebody also sent me some pictures of some plays that he did when he was uh, uh, working in California. At, at, I think it was like Knott's Berry Farm. And he was in like a Grease, he did like Grease Lightning, and it was pretty cool to see him as Danny Zuko. Um, I think he was Danny Zuko. Um, but yeah, so, um, yeah, L.A. was there just for like a minute. I saw Mickey Dolenz from The Monkees, which my parents took me to see The Monkees in, I think it was like 85 or 86, and they got us backstage passes, and I got to meet all the monkeys. Peter was my favorite. And it was really weird. So like, God, 40 odd years later, running into Mickey Dolenz. Got to say hi but, and give him a fist bump. He was just trying to get to the elevator. Um, but I think I was the only one who recognized him, which was really weird. But uh, it was cool to see him. And uh, LA is a wild place. Um, so today, we're going to talk about reformation, you know. Um, I, I've been looking for part-time jobs. Um, right now, I haven't been getting a lot of luck because I have a parenting schedule changes every week. Um, and so a lot of the jobs, like, I'm looking at are part-time jobs because I want that to support my family, and this helps support my family as well, but also support this work because this is my main focus is revolution and uh, studying and, and, and reading and things like that. So um, that, that was uh, stuff. But I've also put out stuff about my speaking. And I, I think one of the things I want to tell people is like, want to be part of the Reformation? <laughs> Reformation 2024? <laughs> Book me. Let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can cause some trouble. Um, you know, makes you really, really think things. I'll tell you, being a parent of young children in late-stage capitalism is pretty scary, you know. Um, I talked to a friend today who's, who's dealing with it and job insecurity and, and, and kids and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a scary thing. It really is. And I think it's something that I see people talking more about online and I hope people continue to talk about it because there's so many folks out here uh, really suffering to make ends meet and going through a lot and going through a lot of pain. And uh, I think sometimes just realizing you're not alone helps. And also having friends who, you know, are willing to help and support is, is, is really cool too. And uh, yeah, and it's funny because I, I, I had a friend of mine from like, I posted something and saying, you know, about unfair minimum wage stuff and I said I'd heard liberals say this too and of course one of my liberal friends was like I've never heard that <laughs> you know and we had to have a long conversation um because I've, I've heard it first here you know I've heard they'll pull yourself up by your bootstraps like when you start looking for work you know it's funny how what, what, what people say the, fun, the things that they say um you know even the most liberal folks you know start to become very strong, independent, uh, uh, you know, hard-working people, you know. Oh, well, that's good. You need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make this happen. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't be able to make money as a pastor online. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Um, I think communism would be better. I don't know who that said that, but yeah, sure. Of course, if you watch all the scary movies and read the news, that sounds like a really scary idea. Um, just don't have a dictator. Um, but unfortunately, we have capitalism and we have a dictator, so boop, whoop, whoop. And we have two parties that aren't that different from each other. 
uh, at some value they are, um, and I get that. I get why, but financially they aren't. Where they invest, they aren't. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Hey, good luck. We're going to get everybody's opinion on what we think should happen. Um, let them come in. All right, so revolution, um, actually reformation is what I'm thinking today, and I believe that reformation for the church, I'm not going to try to reform the country. I'll leave that up to uh, all you experts out there. Um, Reformation through the church, though, for me, is through grace, which grace and the concept of anarchy, of that grace covers everyone uh, across the board, so it's always going to piss you off, and there's always going to be somebody you wish didn't get it. Um, Scholarship, biblical scholarship, I think, is vitally important in playing a part in uh, Reformation, because I think uh, the reality of, of what the Bible is and isn't, and what it's saying and isn't saying, and uh, taking it within its full, fa- you know, the full, the full feel, uh, uh, scholarly understanding of the biblical text is vitally important rather than carrying tradition from, like, you know, angry people who think they understand. Um, it, it, scholars, I think, are very important and play a big, big por- part in, in, in what the Bible is and isn't. And I think we should be focusing more on that. I think we, we, we may, maybe the mistake was too many theologians. Now, I like theology, but uh, theologians are, you know, a lot of people sharing their opinion about what God is, um, you know, and, and, and scholars are trying to come in and say, well, this is what this book is, and this is when it was written, and this is who it was written to, and this is why, and uh, these words actually mean these things. And uh, it, it can be tough because it can shake you because it's, it's learning that maybe everything you were raised to believe isn't right, or the things that you even learned later and <laughs> when you became a liberal and was like, oh, look what I found out, you know, even find out that's not even right. And, and I've had some of those points happen to me a few times, and it's not the most fun. Um, but it's good, you know. It's like, hey, we all got to learn together. It, it, it's, not, it's not about this way of thinking or that way of thinking. It's just about well, what does it say. And the funny thing is why I respect scholarship so much is because I was kind of raised a biblical literalist, you know, like the Bible's, there's no contradictions, and blah, blah. now of course I find out there's contradictions and things like that, but the only reason I find out there's contradictions and that there's, uh, you know, uh, books of the Bible that shouldn't be in there and, and, and written by the other wrong people and, you know, and things added later was because of scholarship. And so for me, like, I think that that would be the next obvious move from being a literalist would be like, oh, well, we've got to literally figure out what this is and what it actually says and what it doesn't say and, and start taking away some of these things, um, you know, and, and, and understanding what within what context they were written to us to understand. So I think scholarship plays a big part in that. I think also philosophy plays a big part of that, and we're going to touch that part today. Um, so I think philosophy and psychology. All these things, I think, play a big part in if we want to see a reformation within religious communities, these are things we're going to have to do. We're going to have to embrace grace, because we're going to need grace through this whole thing. We're going to need grace when we're here in scholarship that even rubs us the wrong way, and philosophy, and psychology. Um, I, I really believe people like, I believe the reason Freud wrote so simply is because Freud was really trying to help people understand their, you know, unconscious and things like that. It doesn't matter if you agree with them or not, because that's not the point here right now. The point is, is that he was trying to understand, uh, help us understand uh, how the unconscious works and how we work and how we think and things like that. And I think we need to be more open to that, because then we can realize, like, what is a trick? What is an actual trigger? You know, what is an actual thing like that? You know, everybody thinks like their ex-pastor or their ex-lover was a, uh, uh, what is it, a narcissist, you know, when we, but we use that word really badly out of context, you know, I overuse it. And gaslighting, we use that over context, we use all these things. Triggers, we use that over context, you know. Um, so we just, we're all playing like the, the armchair psychologists. But I think reading and studying proper psychology can help us understand these things. So, the Bible. Where does the Bible play? Well, scholarship, partly. But I want to talk about Matthew again. We talked about this when I was uh, when I did my last talk uh, two weeks ago. We talked about Matthew, and I, I am going to jump right back to where I was in Matthew five, and it's forty three, where it says. Uh, you have heard 
that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Makes sense, right? Most of us are good at that. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, so they may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and on sends the rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. It's strange to me that I've found that progressive Christians, at least the ones that follow me on Facebook, seem to struggle with this more than even my conservative brothers and sisters um, nowadays because they're always like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll argue well, um, but if they don't see this or they don't recognize this or they don't do that, then I'm, I'm out, which I get that self-care and things like that. Um, and you got to watch yourself. But biblically, if you're a follower of Christianity and, you, and this is your religion and, and this is the faith you're subscribing to, you know, this was a big deal that Jesus is changing the scriptures saying, you know, it's not about being pissed off at people anymore. It's about loving those people that you disagree with and don't recognize your, your humanity and don't recognize you as a human being. You know, that's what Jesus is calling to. And I've, I've seen the arguments. I know what the arguments are. I'm just saying this is where biblically it takes us. Now, I'm not saying that this is like, I'm going to turn into like a neo-Calvinist and be like, no, women, you stay in bad marriages and things like that. No, 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 no. If you did, you wouldn't be loving a person. To allow them to abuse you is not loving them. Allowing them to abuse someone else is not loving them. Allowing people to be abusive is not loving them. Okay, let's just get that out. To sit there and watch someone hurt someone else is not helpful because they are victimizing people but what we also have to realize is that probably at one point in their life, they were victims of something similar. So how do we love them as we help them find a way through maybe psychology to get to a place where they can get help through that route of where they were hurt and what made them a victim and turned them into a victimizer? You know, could you imagine if you saw like, you know, what it was like for, you know, I know a lot of you don't like Donald Trump. So what it would be like to see Donald Trump as childhood? videotaped <laughs> as a film. Could you imagine if you watch it as a film and you didn't know who it was about? You know, then you can empathize and then afterwards they go, it was there's no excuse. There's no excuse. You know, we, we, we definitely change the way we think about people you know, that way. Um, so what I try to do is, is remember that these people were probably victims and children who had to go through something similar. Um, but to allow them to keep that cycle going is not to love them. So here, you know, that, I mean, that should be the basic understanding, but it's not always, or it's not always the first thing to our mind. So we kick back and go like, well, what about this? Or what about that? To fight it, to argue it, to argue loving, to argue showing grace. But the thing is, it's like, it, it's trying to finish a whole cycle. You know, we're trying to finish this, like, we're trying to end a cycle of that. So that's loving your enemies as well. So Jesus says, you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then it gets really kind of weird when Jesus says, don't even Gentiles, uh, you know, love their, love their friends and hate their enemies. <laughs> and then he says, be perfect, though, for your heavenly father is perfect. So he's saying if you want to be godlike and, and experience that love, that God is love, that uh, I think First John or Second John says, um, then learn to love people. And loving people is not, you know, you can do it from a distance. You can pray for people. You can love from a distance. Um, but we definitely need people who go in and are healers and people who are restorers and gently restore and humbly restore, as it talks about in Galatians. And, and that comes with a lot of understanding of, of unconscious and conscious and experience and life experiences and things like that. So I do think that that would be part of, of because I think there would be more grace for us in, in, in the communities in the church to, to, to share with others and give to others and not uh, load impossible standards on them as though they just woke up evil one day or that they were just born evil one day, you know, that we realize that we live in a very uh, messed up world. Um, but so, so what, is, what is loving your enemy and how do we look at that through philosophy? And that's really how I wanted to look at it today. So I really like Hegel, but I can't read Hegel on my own. So um, I read books about Hegel because it helps me understand Hegel a little bit more. Um, and this is a book I really like. It's called Emancipation After Hegel. Now look at that second part. What does that say? 
achieving a contradictory revolution. A what? A contradictory revolution. And so I'm going to share some of this today about how is it, what is our enemies, what does loving our enemies look like, what is it being and having enemies, you know? I'm so glad that I don't have one group I can point out to be like, those guys are my enemies, you know? I just, uh, my enemies are, are diverse, just like my, my message. <laughs> and just like all of us, hopefully, like not just diverse, but diverse thinking. And so I have people from all different classes who don't like me. It's, it's very entertaining and exciting. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be reading from um, McGowan's uh, book here. Opposition, uh, I'm going to start with this, uh, opposition such as the opposition between theists and anti-theists divided the world into friends and enemies. Hegel's philosophy represents through going rejection of the opposition between friend and enemy insofar as it in inter interprets opposition not as genuine opposition but merely a form of contradiction takes on. So he's saying like when we run into contradiction and we become enemies, it's almost like a contradiction takes on these forms of friends and enemies. Opposition expresses contradictions while op obfuscation itself destructiveness. Through, open, through opposition might require one to go to war. It provides an external enemy to fight in coherent sense of identity for oneself which is most important is which is the most important ideological function so an ideological function uh for us is that often we find our inner our 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 our, our um it, it provides us with an identity we find our identity through who our enemy is so you know well i'm not like them you know, how many times, like in the 90s, I was like, I'm a Christian, but not like that. And probably in the early 2000s, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm a kind of different kind of Christian. Or when someone's like sitting on an airplane, goes, oh, what do you do? <laughs> well, I'm a pastor, but I'm a blah, blah, blah pastor. You know, I focus more on blip, 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 blip. And now I don't even just say pastor anymore. Now I'm just like, I'm a thinker. And I really like <laughs> history and philosophy and theology. Um, gets more interesting conversations going. Today, we erect the figures of fundamental terrorists as oppositional to the global capitalist universe they attack. The opposition creates a sense of identity for those within the universe, while also gives them a target onto which to pour their animosity. But the, opposite, but the opposition hides the contradiction of the global capitalist system that is the mere existence of terrorism suggests. Hegel thought demands that we refuse the image of the opposition between the global capitalist theist and the fundamental terrorist anti-theist in order to see the contradiction that inhibits both positions. This his basic philosophy operation. So where is the contradiction in, within both positions? Now I know this is difficult and it, it requires us to think. I hope you'll order this book and try to read it. I think it's worth it. Um, I did a revolution recommendations and, and, and recommended this book because it's really been a huge impact in my life. Um, and this was just me going back to the beginning where I was like, oh, you know, there's all these parts about uh, Hegel's belief and faith in Christianity that I really like in the back. But this is I really wanted to look into the contradiction. What is contradiction? Why do I wear a medallion that says contradiction on it? Um, so here, we'll go on further. When the figure of the terrorist emerges, the contradiction disappears into opposition. For the part, fundamentalist terrorists attack the system that provides the basis for their identity. Fundamentalism promises a return to some form of traditional value. Did you hear that? Fundamental, fundamentalism promises a return to some form of traditional values. But these values have their significance only through their absence in the global capitalist universe. Through the act of destroying traditional values, global capitalism gives these values their significance for the fundamentalists. Very interesting. 
Recognizing this enables us to challenge the ideology of opposition. Did you hear that? The ideology. We're going to challenge the ideology of opposition. So when you are loving your enemies and doing good to those who persecute you, what are you doing? You are, you are you are challenging the ideology, the ideology of enemies, of opposition. You're making something different. You're showing there's a different way. There's another way that we haven't been thinking about. So this is why philosophy is important. You know, it's not just a bunch of people, you know, sitting in, you know, leather-bound chairs and, you know, surrounded by leather-bound books, you know, smoking cigars going, <laughs> yes, those people. You know, it's not that. It's like there's a vital reason why it's there. And, and the more I've been studying, I've been trying to study this study for Romans, uh, a really in-depth, super in-depth study uh, schol through scholarship on Paul and Romans, and I've been learning so much about Paul and how, you know, he probably spent time with so many philosophers and the philosophers he spent with and what he knew and what he didn't know, and it's quite intriguing. Um, and and I'm, I'm hoping we're going to pick another night of the week once I figure out what my job situation is to have just a real in-depth study on the book of Romans. Um, I think it's going to be really cool. Um, recognizing that it enables us to challenge the ideology of opposition. Hegel's philosophy of contradiction deprives a subject of their enemies, which also deprives them of their image of self-identity. So the reason is we, I think we fear is when we don't have a solid enemy, we lose our self-identity. I'm going to just tell you this in a real basic way. For me, like a matter of fact, the other day when I was online and I was posting something and I felt like this post was scapegoating people on the right, and not people on the left, like I didn't feel like it was being completely fair, so I put in a little a little uh, asterisk. And you know how I'm not an asterisk fan. I put the asterisk in, and it was like, but I've also seen this on the left, you know? And then I had a very dear friend of mine reach out and be like, I've never heard this, I've never seen this, and they were upset because they, you know? And what I've realized is for me is like, now we don't identify through the politics of, 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 of the left. You know, I, even though I'm a, I feel like I'm a leftist, but I don't feel like we, you know, I don't identify now so much with my Democrat brothers and sisters or my conservative brothers or sisters, and I'm thinking differently, and I'm trying to think deeper and look at things. And, I, you know, I owe a lot of this to my buddy Pete Rollins, who really did help me uh, with understanding philosophy and, and looking at things like this. Um, but, yeah, so this is, this is the issue here, you know. We, 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 so my identity is now not wrapped up in... Now my identity is like, I like punk rock music, and I'm a leftist, you know. Um, and what does that even mean? You know, who am I? <laughs> it, it becomes a little more loosey-goosey, and I find people don't like that loosey-goosey. People like things they can kind of sink their teeth in and like the identity. Like, what is your identity? Is your identity? And when we talk about identity politics, I don't think we're just talking about, like, black and white and Asian and... Indian and, and uh, you know, African and gay and straight and bi and trans, you know, I think I, uh, you know, I, 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 ID politics also falls into, like, I find my identity as a liberal. I find my identity as a conservative. You know, this is my identity. What will I have without it, you know? Um, like, you look at a lot of these people who are, like, like when, you, when you watch the political, like, uh, conventions, they might as well be at a, like a concert, but they're like an uncool concert where everybody wore the, you know, the concert tee. You know, and they're all like, oh, I'm dressed like Captain America or like whatever. You know, I'm, the, I'm Captain America conservative. I'm Captain America liberal. You know, and everybody's like gone mad. And you see like this identity that's based in this. And the fact is, yes, politics can change things, but politics cannot control us. You know, politics cannot, I mean... It, they try to, but politics shouldn't, you know, I want to, I'm going to go and say, like, I like what this group's saying. I like this was, Mitt Romney just came out and said some stuff I really liked, you know, like he's a conservative Mormon. So there you go. Um, I'm not done yet. And it's funny, now I see people saying, I'm on the left, I'm on, are you on the right? But, but, you know, you're already like, what's your identity? Well, my identity isn't that, my identity is not being on that. So we're already discussing in the discussions right now, Identity. You are not that. You are not those politicians. You are not those crappy politicians on both sides. Yeah, liberal just got indicted too. You know, we got conservatives and liberals all going to jail because they're screwing around 
and they care more about capitalism and billionaires than they do about humans and people. And then they will say, oh, no, I care about you, and I care about this situation. So there you go. Um, so well, I'm seeing someone pro pro say, show me what their identity isn't. You know, so there you go. That's how fantastic is that? Um, thank you for helping me with my talk. <laughs> Improve my point. Um, recognize this enables us to challenge the ideology of opposition. Hegel's philosophy of contradiction deprives subjects of their enemies. Now, hopefully, this is what we can think, which also deprives them of their image of self-identity. So that gives them a deprives them of this image of self-identity that we really do through who we're against or who we're not or what we're not. So that's really interesting, right? Oh, I forgot. I can't hear you guys. Right. I believe this is all reform ideas. Like, honestly, like, I would like to be speaking in churches all over America, conservative and liberal churches all over America for the next five years just talking about this type of thing. I think it's invaluable. I think it's important. Um, and I think it what could reform us to become better people. It would even be better to be able to have a, a, a situations where we could bring liberal and conservatives together and, and be like, all right, we're going to do this in your town, but we're going to do it here. You know, But you have to get everybody to show up, and part of their identity is not like socializing with that other identity, so it would have to be like a trick, you know, like we're giving something free away. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're giving <laughs> deep fryer. I don't know. I'm trying to think what everybody likes. Um, Hegel's philosophy, we're going on further. Hegel's philosophy systematically uncovers contradiction lurking within opposition. The philosophy enables us to see the opposition are really just contradictions in disguise. The philosophy enables us to see the oppositions are really just contradictions in disguise. Those we imagine as enemies most often, now this is my, this is what I like, and I'm preaching this like, a, like the Bible. Um, those we imagine as enemies most often turn out to be versions of ourself, which doesn't eliminate the need for fighting them but just changes the conditions of the fight. Did you hear that? Those we imagine as enemies most often turn out to be versions of ourself, which doesn't eliminate the need for fighting them, but just changes the conditions of the fight. So on Revolution's Instagram, I follow a lot of like progressive Christians. And one of the things I see a lot of common ground is, is anger and mocking and accusing and reliving in the past. And then I look at the right and I remember that's just what the right did as I was growing up. And so it's like we just trade one version for another version so we can live within the opposition and continue to find our identity within this opposition. Like I'm not, I'm a progressive Christian, or I'm an atheist, or I'm a theist, or I'm a, you know, and I don't like those people. And so even when, and then when you start writing books about like those people and why you're right and they're wrong, your whole identity gets based in it. You know, like, oh, well, he's an apologist. So we know that he believes that everything there is true. You know, and that's, they're not, I'm, I'm an apologist. I am a man of God, you know, growing up. I fight sin, so I must be holy. And then we find out no one's that holy. Interesting, right? So I'm challenging all your thoughts here, hopefully, or Hegel is, uh, me through Hegel and uh, Todd McGowan, by asserting the primacy of contradiction in relationships to opposition. Hegel breaks with all, philosophy, all philosophies that establish identity through the contrast between self and other, between friend and enemy. As a result, a popular reading of Hegel that imagines contradiction in terms of antith antithesis through betray his radically enabled... Well, okay, basically what it's arguing is like a lot of people don't understand this about Hegel's writings. A lot of people try to reject this and boil it down to that somehow Hale is setting us free from contradictions. But uh, people like Todd McGowan and Slavo Zizek, uh, Rollins, and folks like that would argue against that, saying, no, 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 He's, and Helen Rollins as well would, would, would argue, no, 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 it's embracing the contradiction. We've got to learn to embrace the contradiction. And we really do go into a deeper level of ourselves. 
And then what happens there is that's why psychology, I think, needs to come in. Because all of a sudden we're going, to, if my identity isn't based on what my political party is or what my faith is or what kind of music I listen to or don't listen to, oh my God, who am I? You know, am I just a guy who likes tacos? <laughs> Which is enough for me, really. If you're just a, a guy or a gal or a they or them who likes tacos, I'm good with you. Um, let's look at this and I'll try to wrap it up. Um, because I have a, a, a children's birthday party to go to after this. <laughs> so if you're mad at me, just know I'll be at a child's birthday party after this, and so that should just allow you to sleep really well. Um, <laughs> and here we go. Um, what Hegel calls the resolution of contradiction is not its elimination through a third term, as the idea of synthesis suggests, Instead, it is the reconciliation with contradiction, the recognition that contradiction is not a problem to be eliminated, but the driving force of all movements in being. One cannot arrive at a synth synthesis that would eliminate contradiction because contradiction is the basic fact of all being. We all have contradictions, some we can change, some we can't. That's one of the things that psychoanalysis helped me with. Also, my psychoanalysis was Freudian and Hegelian, so that was really cool. Um, one cannot arrive at the synthesis that would eliminate contradiction because contradiction is the basis, basic fact of, of all being. This is at the heart of Hegel's philosophy, which is the formula thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is utterly betrayal. So he's talking about what these people have tried to throw on to Hegel's beliefs. I'm going to Go down to one more thing here and read this to you and talk about it, and then we all go home. Well, I am home, so I'm going to go to a kid's party in a park. Hegel concludes the science of logic, Hegel concludes in the science of logic with the absolute idea, which is this. Affirmation that contradiction is unsurpassable. This is why he is getting at, this is what he's getting at in the discussion where he claims, in fact, the thought of contradiction is essential moment of the concept. Once one sees that contradiction is not a trap to be avoided, but the essential moment of concept, that that's contradiction kind of gives life to a concept, sometimes even a greater truth. You know, I mean, you look at like Green Party or you look at, um, uh, what are those other guys called? Uh, the, uh, the, Libertarians, you know, and you look at what they take and what happens there, there's a different identity, right? Um, trap to avoid, but the essential moment of the concept, one entire approach must change. Oh, so I love Affirmation that contradiction is unsurpassable. That is why he is getting at the discussion he claims a fact through contradiction is essential moment of concept. That's what I just read. New, new sentence. Once one sees that contradiction is not a trap to be avoided, but the essential moment of the concept, one entire approach must change. So this is why I believe Reformation now, 500 years after the last Reformation, 500 and some change, is possible through this, okay? Because I think here is a very reformed Reformation, new Reformation saint. As the essential moment of the concept, one's entire approach must change. So... What happens is when we reform, we rethink, we get rid of some old stuff, we maybe take on some new stuff, and we're going to say, okay, they, we, we have got this idea that this contradiction has been bad, and we've been fighting, and we've been killing each other over it, and now we realize that this, we've got to think about it differently, and that it might actually be an essential moment of concept for all of us and all of our belief systems, and we must change our entire pr approach. It's not saying that we won't disagree or that we won't disagree well or that we won't argue and there might not even be times where we go to war, but it's saying these things will change. What an enemy looks like will change. How we do those things will change. That's what Jesus was asking us to do, is love your enemy, be kind to those who persecute you. Going as far as almost jokingly, which it felt like, but he probably was serious. <laughs> they want to sue you, give them your coat. You know, here, you want this? Here, take this, you know. Um, so these are radical ideas. And radical concepts that are shared by some of the most brilliant men that have been sometimes kept from us because we were afraid of it, because we were scared of it. Because I and I've been afraid of philosophy for many years, and 
Now I'm reading about the most complicated philosopher. There is. Why? Because I find that there's this truth that runs within me, the purpose that runs within me is to see a change in people's lives through grace. And grace works on its own. But also, you know, I want to have you help you and be with you when we all have these moments of going, aha, aho, oh my gosh, I didn't think about it that way. And that's what happens when I read philosophy is I'm going, oh wow, this is really like a, a grace concept that I'd never really thought about or put into words. Like, this is how I love my enemies. This is why I love my enemies. It's because of this. You know, so if Jesus is the son of God, adopted by God, or born of a virgin, or whatever you want to think, of the ground of being, well, there's an idea that this was known within those, when, when Jesus was saying these things, that this is going to change everything. And what we have done is we've just made more enemies. Christians have just said, oh, we're another denomination. Oh, another denomination. Oh, no, let's just do another denomination. Oh, nope, these guys don't agree with us. Well, how many of us? Well, there's a little bit more of us. Okay, we'll just start another denomination. You know, and um, I, I kind of wish political parties would have done that, but the political parties have become so powerful that they're like, nope, just two, and it's free choice wherever you go. Uh, I remember uh, Chris Christopherson said, you know, about Johnny Cash, John, he's a walking contradiction, partly truth, partly fiction, you know? And I used to think like, oh my God, what if my best friend told me I was a con contradiction, I'd be really pissed. And now I like got so excited about contradiction and living within contradiction that I called a friend of mine in, uh, in another country and said, hey, you make necklaces, can you make a big scary necklace? I didn't say that. I said, but could you put some contradiction, because it's a really long word, on a necklace? And he goes, yes, da, da, and here it is, contradiction. And this is why I'm excited about it. This is why I talk about it. You know, next week we'll probably have five million followers because we're just all so enlightened by this, right? <laughs> uh, it's a tough, tough road, folks. Um, the essential moment of the concept, one's entire approach much change. Hegel's philosophy moves towards the recognition that contradiction is absolutely absolute by thinking through a successive contradiction. This is the content of the absolute idea. Now, there is so much more good stuff to read in this, but I'm going to finish with that. And I hope I encourage you to, you know, check this out or... Um, you can at least Google Todd McGowan. Uh, I got to see him speak in Belfast, and it was really beautiful. I, I remember seeing him give this book to somebody, and I remember thinking, like, I'll, I, would, that, I have no desire to read that book about Hegel. Like, that seems like the most absurd, weird thing. Why would I ever think about that? Like, just, I just I had, and those were the thoughts going through my head. And he was talking about capitalism, like, oh, I like what he's saying about capitalism. But then I saw this book, and I thought, not the book for me. And now this book is like, I've lost the cover. I've put blue stripes on the side so I can always see it whenever it's on the bookshelf. I lost it yesterday, you know, and tracked it down. And, you know, I just, just it's a well-loved book. It's a well-loved idea. And I think it sums up, I think, Hegel and, and McGowan's view of Hegel uh, really shows us what Matthew 5, 43 and 44 and the Beatitudes are actually saying. And I really do believe that almost to the point where I believe Refer Re revolution should almost change its name to reformation because I believe that this is the ideas that come together. We bring these ideas together and, and we go to a new place. We bring conservatives and liberals together and, 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 and we come to a new place and we learn how to argue well, listen well, disagree well. And you know what? We might even be able to be friends despite our differences because we realize that you know, our identities might even be tied up in it and that we get into a deeper place of understanding our identities and who we are and who they are. And it becomes something that's, you know, maybe we want people to see people live well, you know, and live life well, even people we don't agree with. Um, you know, even if it's at the sense of like Tupac said, like, just because you hurt me and you're my enemy, I don't want to see you starve. I just don't eat at my table. Now, I would love everybody to eat at one table and we all see sing Amazing Grace together and sway back and forth. Um, that might not always work, but at least we've got that. So, there you go. I um, hope you check that out. Thanks, kids. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. And um, I, have, I have big hopes, high hopes and big vision. And that has not gone away. 
Emancipation After Hegel is the book title. I will show it to you once again if you want to do a screenshot with my pretty face in the background. And there you go. Uh, what is this? Achieving a contradiction, contradictory revolution. So let's achieve a contradictory uh, reformation as well. So let's throw that in there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy the cupcake parties and the small talk because small talk is my favorite thing. Devil, if you're hearing me. Um, <laughs> once again, Steve Peters, who I got to celebrate last week. Uh, ironically found out from some of his friends that Steve also didn't like to raise money, but he also pushed Jay Baker to raise money. And yes, I'm a baker, so this is your time to make your jokes and be silly and be mean to me if you'd like. If you really want to get under my skin, this is the time to do it. Revolution needs your support. We need your support financially. Um, if we had a goal, if we were able to reach the goal of like 20,000 by the end of this year, um, there would be a good chance that I could do this full time and start looking for a uh, dive bar to even start meeting in person. Um, if, and I'm wondering if that would be something some of you are interested in too, but I know that you're, a lot of you aren't in this area. Um, and, and be able to do that, that would be great. I would love to continue to do this full time, but I'm also willing to do it part time and still bring you everything we can do in studies and things like that. Um, but if you want to help support Revolution financially, you can go to revolutionchurch.com and we have Venmo and PayPal and you can support there. You can support monthly. Um, I said 20 grand by the end of this year because uh, that was the last thing we have. I have not looked to see what we've brought in recently, but I will say I did get paychecks, which was really nice. I appreciate you and our financial folks uh, <laughs> who pester me about raising money because I also have to pay them. They got paid as well. So I do appreciate it, and uh, I've been a little bit more consistent with that. And Steve, um, Peter is my, my late uh, surrogate father in Christ, uh, pushed me to do this. And so now I will blame him and anybody else who wants to blame Jim Baker or the prosperity gospel or any of that. But, you know, I'm not going to tell you you're going to get rich. But, you know what, if the prosperity gospel is right, then, you're, then oh, my goodness, put it as much as you can. <laughs> but we need your support, so that's it. Thank you, everybody. Um, embrace the contradiction. This is a good place to start. And uh, I'm reading about five other books that I have on contradiction and Hegel on contradiction because I want to kind of get a full scope of different opinions on uh, Hegel's contradiction. Um, hey, small monthly donations. Have, Revolution has been built off of small monthly donations by large amounts of people. I mean, I'm, again, I'm saying even if all 11 of you made small monthly donations, uh, that would probably help us quite a bit. Um, so thank you all for supporting us, tithing to Revolution, supporting me as a teacher. And uh, that really means the world to me. And I will continue to be able to bring you the best I can and only work on making that better and better and better. And uh, hopefully we will see a, a reformation of contradiction in the world. All right, folks, thank you so much. Lots of love, lots of grace. Have a good week. Be kind to each other, love each other, and talk to each other. And you know what? If you see people going through a hard time, uh, help them the best you can because I find that I've had a lot of folks reach out to me lately and um, say a few kind words, and it's made huge differences. Um, so lots of love, lots of grace. Same bad time, same uh, contradiction hour next week. See you then. Bye-bye. listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. To make your 100% tax deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website.